had uh, all throughout these last uh, seven or eight months since the middle of March. And as always, I'm so grateful that you're here joining us, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or on our web website. We are uh, grateful, as always, to be joining you. And we've got uh, just an amazing guest that I'll get to uh, in a minute. But before that, I want to thank our team, uh, as always, for putting this together, our fantastic uh, staff, both in Washington, D.C. and in our uh, beautiful district, uh, California 49, as well as Jeremy, who always does such a great job uh, with these video uh, town halls. Uh, I uh, wanted to thank everybody for tuning in uh, virtually uh, again uh, after, you know, this is the, the actual, the, the rescheduled version of this virtual town hall. The last time uh, that we were ready to do this particular town hall, I got called away to vote uh, literally, uh, you know, with like an hour to go before the town hall. That's the, the crazy nature of our schedule uh, sometime when I'm in D.C. But I'm very grateful uh, to be back today with our friend Marshall Burke from Stanford University. Uh, and we'll be having a, a very good conversation uh, about climate change, about wildfires and so much else impacting us uh, here in the state of California. Uh, before we jump into that discussion, I do have a few updates that I wanted to share on the legislative front. Just last week, my friend and colleague from San Diego, Susan Davis, uh, and I introduced bipartisan legislation to help eligible active duty service members enroll in school meal programs. Uh, and while there's much more we have to do to improve the financial well-being of our men and women in uniform, and we're always committed to that, uh, this uh, legislation, we believe, is an important step towards ensuring that military parents, particularly around Camp Pendleton in our district, uh, can focus on fulfilling their mission rather, on, rather than on where their kids uh, will find their next meal. So earlier this month, in addition to that, my Restoring Community Input and Public Protections and Oil and Gas Leasing Act uh, passed as well out of the Natural Resources Committee. We had a spirited hearing and uh, had to get through many amendments, but uh, the basic idea behind that legislation is that Americans have a right to beautiful public lands and they deserve to have a voice when it comes to potential oil and gas leasing on those public lands. It's long past time that we end the giveaways to fossil fuel companies and instead provide transparency and accountability over their efforts to exploit public lands. I'm really happy that my colleagues saw fit uh, to give this important legislation uh, a, uh, a full hearing and also to give our local community members a seat at the table to protect our natural resources. Also, I'm very pleased that now three weeks ago, uh, the House of Representatives passed our uh, DELIVER Act, Dependable Employment and Living Improvements for Veterans Economic Recovery. I love the acronym. Uh, this was a truly bipartisan bill. Uh, it has a bicameral Senate counterpart, and I think it has a fantastic chance of becoming law this year. Uh, very briefly, what the bill would do, uh, so many veterans have been impacted uh, by the pandemic, both in terms of their housing, their uh, ability to go and find work during all this or being out of work. Uh, and this bill would go a long way towards uh, dealing with those crises. It would dramatically expand the flexibility of VA uh, to serve veterans who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. Uh, I actually worked, believe it or not, with the Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy. Bipartisanship is still alive and well when it comes to serving our veterans. Uh, and uh, the bill would expand eligibility uh, and improve the uh, HUD BASH VA Supportive Housing Voucher Program, uh, which uh, is a very important program, but is being underutilized uh, in certain parts of the country. And, and certainly that's ca the case in California. Uh, in addition, it would create a year long rapid retraining program for our veterans so that they can get back into the workforce. We've been making such great strides uh, with regard to veteran employment. Uh, I'm the chair of a subcommittee with jurisdiction over veteran employment and, and several other things. And so we're very proud uh, of that uh, part of the legislation. I worked on it with Dr. Phil Rowe, uh, Republican member from Tennessee. And I just think, again, it's a good example of what, what can be done when we put aside uh, any partisan differences and we come together for the good of those who served uh, our country. Uh, I, I mentioned that I didn't know whether it would be heard in the Senate and, and voted on in the Senate before or after uh, the election. And unfortunately, if you've been following, watching the news, you know that priority right now in the Senate 
uh, rather than on another COVID relief bill or rather than on any of the other good bipartisan legislation uh, that has made it through the House has been on the confirmation process of uh, Judge Barrett. And we will have to see if there will be time for the Senate to prioritize anything else between now uh, and 20 days from now. But it, it's certainly my, my hope that if it doesn't uh, pass the Senate before the election, it'll pass after the election, putting it on the president's desk to sign hopefully by the end of the year. We've had great uh, success getting our veterans legislation over the finish line. We've introduced 20 bipartisan bills. 12 of them have passed the House. Four of them have already been signed into law by President Trump. Uh, and I am very proud of that. Another key piece of legislation uh, that passed the House recently is the Clean, Clean Economy Jobs and Innovation Act. And I was proud that it includes several, included several of the uh, provisions that I advocated for, the amendments that I advocated for. Um, one of those uh, is a $500 million program for research and development for spent nuclear fuel. And if you haven't seen, our office has created this report, uh, our task force uh, that we empowered to do it. It's headed by a, a former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and a retired Navy Admiral. Uh, and it's all about the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, the, uh, uh, you know, having to deal with the, the over 100,000 tons throughout the United States of spent nuclear fuel. This is critically important, not only for our district, but really the entire country. And as I've said time and again, the fact that we have 1,700 tons of waste sitting on our coastline near earthquake faults, near 8.3 million people, I think is really uh, uh, indicative of a larger problem uh, that we lack anywhere to send the entire nation's spent nuclear fuel. So our report uh, and efforts subsequent to that report uh, really do seek to uh, find new solutions. And one of those is, of course, more research and development. And that's what uh, our amendment would do, a $500 million program for that. It was included in the Clean Energy Jobs Innovation Act. And overall, this bill develops renewable and distributed energy resources, improves energy efficiency in homes and businesses, helps electrify the transportation sector, modernizes the grid, reduces carbon pollution, prioritizes the needs of environmental justice communities, and much more. And I'm really proud of the effort. And within the larger context of what we're trying to do with the uh, Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and our Climate Action Plan, which if you haven't checked it out, I'm very proud to have been a big part of that work along with my colleagues. You can go to climatecrisis.house.gov. So climate crisis, one word, .house.gov and you can read our report. Or if you don't have time to read a 500 page report, you can read, I think a four page summary. And if you don't have time for that, I think we have a one page summary. And if you don't have time for that, I don't know what to tell you. So hopefully you can at least see a one page summary. But um, I wanted to turn to wildfires. We are now seeing uh, truly unprecedented wildfires throughout the American West. Uh, Four million acres and counting that have burned just in California alone. One of the fires I, I've seen now is over a million acres, just one fire. Uh, and we've really never seen anything like that. And first and foremost, I want to uh, offer my thoughts uh, and those of, of my wife, Chrissy, because I know she feels the same as I do. Uh, we are thinking of and with every family, every community uh, up and down our state throughout the Western United States uh, that uh, are dealing with this. Uh, we've had uh, lives tragically lost as a result, uh, and then there are the indirect effects, and I know we're going to be speaking uh, with Marshall about that um, in just a moment. But uh, in response to these fires, one of the other provisions we got in this clean innovation package that passed the House recently is a program to improve wildfire smoke emissions modeling and to develop smoke forecasts at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The amendment that we passed also directs the EPA to collect data and coordinate research on the impacts of acute air pollution exposure from wildfires. Recent reporting by the LA Times and others revealed that public health experts and scientists lack much needed data on the long-term health impacts of exposure to wildfire smoke. So this legislation is critically important. It's also a stark reminder of why we need to take immediate action to combat the climate crisis. And a reminder that this isn't theoretical, uh, that we are seeing and experiencing the impacts 
of the climate crisis right now in California. Uh, and the extreme weather patterns that we're seeing, the record droughts, the wildfires, unfortunately, it's only the beginning if we don't do something now uh, to act on climate. And unfortunately, the damage will get worse before it gets better. Uh, on that cheery note, uh, I am uh, honored to introduce this week's guest, my good friend, Marshall Burke. Marshall is an associate professor at the Department of Earth System Science, deputy director at the Center on Food Security and the Environment, and center fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at my alma mater, Stanford University. Also a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a co-founder of Atlas AI, a remote sensing startup. His research focuses on social and economic impacts of environmental change and on measuring and understanding economic development in emerging mar markets. And in my humble opinion, he is one of our very best and brightest when it comes to the economics of climate change and the cost not only of taking action, but the cost of doing nothing, which often we don't think about and people don't like to talk about. But Marshall, my friend, thank you for joining us. It is great to see you. Uh, and I'd love to turn it over to you if you had a few opening remarks. Great, uh, Mike, thanks so much for having me. And and I should really start by thank you for your leadership on these really important issues. I mean, Mike just ran down basically a short list of things he's working on now on these issues, but the list is much longer than that. And he has been a real leader in really pushing the ball forward and, and, and using the latest science to inform the decisions we should be making on these topics. So it's really an honor for me to, to, to join Mike and, and talk to you guys about this. So as Mike mentioned, I'm a researcher, so my, my day job's at Stanford, and our research tries to make better measurements of parts of the environment we care about. And the two main parts that I focus on now are, are changes in the climate and changes in related exposures, uh, in particular from wildfires, very important in, in California where we live and, and increasingly throughout the country. And then to try to understand the economic impacts of these exposures. And those range from impacts on our health. Um, as economists, we like to monetize everything. So <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll estimate a health impact and then turn it into dollars because everything needs to be in dollars. Uh, but we also think about impacts on the broader economy of changes in, in climate and in uh, air pollution, uh, et cetera. And, and what we've learned uh, is that these costs uh, of a warming climate or of worsening air are, are very large, and they're probably much larger than we thought. Uh, and this is really important science for when we think about uh, how much should we do to deal with these problems. So the vast majority of Americans are now on board with the basic science here. The climate is warming, humans are mainly to, uh, to blame, um, and that we should do something about it. Uh, you know, again, vast majorities agree with basically those three statements. The question is, how much should we do? What, what should we do and how much should we do, right? And so how do we make that decision? So as an economist, I want to think about this in cost benefit terms, right? I want to, if I'm going to incur a big cost, I want to get some benefits out of that, right? So what we try to do is estimate the benefits. If we reduce warming, how much benefit are you going to get now and in the future? Uh, how much additional benefit do you get from the air pollution improvements you see when uh, you move from coal to natural gas to renewables in the electricity sector? So we try to quantify that. And again, what this what this research shows is uh, that these benefits are huge and you start getting them right away. So as we transition our economy away from dirtier sources of energy to cleaner sources, uh, we reduce warming over the long run, which is beneficial, but we also get these huge immediate benefits in terms of improved air quality, right? Um, so when you see these big price tags on legislation like the Green New Deal or, or, or related investments, people worry, oh, this is just too costly. Look at the trillion dollar price tag. But we have to weigh that against the benefits. And the benefits in our estimates are tens of trillions of dollars, right? Sometimes an order of magnitude larger than the cost we're going to pay. So the science suggests for a lot of these investments that they're actually a pretty darn good deal, even though the price tag sort of up front might look really large. So the last thing to mention is on the wildfires, and this is something that, that we're focused a lot on now and, and many other researchers. And as Mike mentioned, and, and, and really as his legislation makes clear, uh, there's still a lot we don't know here. We, we lack very, uh, certain measurements that we need to really understand what's happening. 
uh, and we lack the long-term exposure studies, again, that will inform this kind of cost-benefit analysis that, that I just talked about. So what can we do here? Uh, there's a lot of proposals on the table. We need to reduce warming. There are things we can do locally to deal with uh, managing fuels better. All of these have costs, right? And so what are the benefits of doing these things? And, and that's what our research is, is trying to figure out. These investments in the research, I think, will go a long way to helping us have a better sense of, of what we should do here. Uh, but the initial evidence is, is, again, that these impacts could, could be pretty bad. Uh, and unless we do something, they're going to get worse. So 2020, as Mike already mentioned, is basically the worst season on record for fires in California um, and has led to an immense amount of suffering, some of it visible. We've seen all the property destroyed, people's lives tragically lost uh, to the fires directly. But the indirect impacts are probably even bigger. We've seen so many people exposed to the smoke, and our calculations would suggest that that has led to a lot of excess health burden, including mortality, uh, that you don't read about in the newspaper. It could be a 1,000 or even 3,000 excess deaths that you're not going to read about in the newspaper. And this is just from extra exposure to smoke. So this is a really bad problem and something we really need to get a handle on. And again, legislation that supports a better understanding of this, I think will make us, uh, put us in a position to make better policy decisions going forward. So I'll stop there, but uh, great to be here. Well, thank you, Marshall, for that uh, great introduction. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, think as we uh, look at the current uh, distrust of science with the, <laughs> with this administration and, and uh, the undermining of our own public health experts and so forth, it, it's refreshing to hear your perspective, and we're going to do everything we can to empower our scientists and empower our public health experts as well. And uh, for those that didn't get a chance to see it, about three weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, there was a great piece on 60 Minutes, and uh, one of the uh, comments was uh, from Michael Mann, who's a, a great climate scientist, and, and he had a quote, there's about as much scientific consensus about human-caused climate change as there is about gravity. And I thought <laughs> I'd said it uh, pretty well, uh, but I hope you check it out. Our friend Wade Crowfoot is uh, on there, and he's been dealing uh, with the wildfires and uh, actually had an interesting uh, back and forth with the president, uh, where uh, Wade, uh, you know, the president said, it'll just get cooler. Don't worry about it. And Wade said, well, I wish the science agreed with you. And the president said, well, I don't think the science really knows, but the facts are that's just wrong. The science does know, and we better listen. I wanted to switch gears uh, briefly, and then we've got plenty of questions for you, Marshall, and, and uh, many of them uh, are climate-related, of course. But I wanted to just update our uh, audience on the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and very, very sad numbers. Obviously, the country has now surpassed 216,000 uh, deaths from COVID-19. U.S. has roughly 4% of the world's population and over 20% of the deaths. Uh, we have uh, approaching unbelievably 8 million cases, 7.9, just under 7.9 million cases. I mentioned 216,000 uh, deaths. California, 863,000 cases, 16,727 uh, deaths. And our two counties, we always talk about uh, how we're doing relative to one another. San Diego County is at 51,000 cases. Orange County is at 56,000 cases. Uh, San Diego County, 840 deaths. Orange County, 1,360 1, uh, deaths. As you all know, about um, over a month ago now, about a month and a half ago, Governor Newsom came out with a new blueprint for a safer economy. It revised the criteria on uh, tiered uh, colors, purple, red, uh, orange, and yellow, based on the prevalence of COVID-19. We are stuck at red, it seems. We were... Uh, hoping that we might see some movement, but the numbers have been stubborn uh, and we remain in that tier two or substantial uh, category for the time being, I means some businesses have been able to open with capacity limitations, others have remained closed altogether. Some schools have been able to open in person, others remain uh, virtual only. Uh, if you wanna really understand what's open, what's not, what the capacities are, are allowed, uh, for different businesses, you go to covid19.ca.gov. That's the uh, governor's new uh, website on this. And over the past seven days, which we're tracking every day, and I thank our great staff for, for tracking this for me, uh, San Diego County has reported an average of 314 new cases 
and 4.9 deaths per day. Uh, and the number of hospitalizations has remained steady. It's currently 178 with a confirmed case. Orange County has reported an average of 167 new cases and 7.4 deaths per day. So lower case rate, but higher, higher, uh, uh, average death per day. And 160 are, uh, in the hospital now with a confirmed case. As we've said, and, and for Marshall's benefit, we've had public health experts, epidemiologists, you know, tons of, of different uh, interactions, and, and it's always the same, which is wear a mask. It's not that hard. Wear a mask, not just for yourself, wear a mask for everyone else. Uh, socially distance, wash your hands, uh, all the things we know that work. They're not that hard to do. It's all about common sense and treating others with respect. Uh, and uh, I really hope that we can uh, do that. And uh, as I've said time and again, the, the sooner we all take those actions that we know work, uh, the better off we'll be and, and the quicker we'll get to those less restrictive tiers. Uh, and in the meantime, we are doing everything we can to try to uh, provide the federal support. Uh, you know, it's, it's been very frustrating the last couple of weeks in Congress, uh, but I've said all along and will continue to say that we cannot have a healthy economy unless we have healthy people. So first and foremost, we've got to crush the, the, the virus itself, the public health aspects of this which means we need to ramp up our testing substantially. We're at around eight, 900,000 tests a day. We need that to be more like 4 million a day based on all the research that I'm seeing. Uh, we also need to get uh, very serious about robust contact tracing. Uh, and look, you know, who would have ever expected the, the White House itself becoming a super spreader uh, location? Uh, but I can only hope that the President of the United States will follow the public health recommendations of his own uh, CDC and, and others. Uh, you probably now know, if you've been watching these town halls, that Congress has passed four bipartisan bills uh, related to COVID-19 all the way back to the beginning of March with the $8 billion for the vaccine, and then the middle of March, $200 billion for nutrition assistance. We still have a horrible situation in the United States where one in four children will go hungry or are, in, are food insecure. Uh, right now, $14 million American families are food insecure right now. So we, we had a short term nutrition assistance, uh, fix and, and we've tried to, to do all we can on that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the middle of March seemingly was, was a, a different era. It was a long time ago and we really didn't know back then that this pandemic would go eight months or longer. We thought it might go eight weeks. We also had, uh, emergency sick leave as part of that. $200 billion package. Remember that 35 million Americans lack emergency sick leave, uh, just like about 30 million Americans lack health insurance, uh, just like 21 million Americans lack high-speed internet access. Pretty hard to work from home or study from home if you don't have high-speed internet access. Uh, and really this pandemic has, has laid bare many of the gaps in our social safety net. 53% uh, of Americans before the pandemic did not have enough money for an emergency. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has already made uh, a tough situation for many millions of Americans that much worse. 26 million Americans are still on unemployment insurance. We know of the 22 million jobs that were lost throughout this pandemic, only about 11 million or half of them are back. And about 5 million are long-term unemployed. And what I would offer, it's, it's a K-shaped recovery. So if you're able to work from home, or particularly if you're invested in the stock market, which has done pretty well, uh, then, well, the pandemic is obviously, you know, you've been impacted by it insofar as, you know, the way that you've been able to, to go to places and things like that. Financially, you're probably doing all right. But what's important to remember is that 87% of the value of the stock market is held by the top 10% of Americans, and that most Americans uh, are not reaping any sort of benefit from this. In fact, most Americans, tens of millions of Americans are uh, absolutely struggling as never before, particularly if they are not able to work from home. So it is so important that we continue with what we did in at the end of March with the CARES Act, $2.2 trillion, uh, $1,200 direct cash payments, $600 expanded unemployment insurance, paycheck protection program to help our small businesses, uh, significant sum for state and local government, significant sum for our K through 12 and our higher education, our hospitals, so many others. Uh, and unfortunately, as I, as I said, we never would have expected this pandemic 
to be still as pervasive, as problematic as it is today, with over 50,000 people getting it a day. Uh, and, you know, the, the numbers are just stunning. So we need more relief. And let's make sure that we reset what got us here. We passed an additional $3.4 trillion bill in the middle of May called the HEROES Act. In May, June, July, and August, Mitch McConnell had the opportunity to work with us, to come up with a counteroffer. I didn't expect McConnell to agree with what was in word for word in the HEROES Act, but I expected a counteroffer, just as there had been in the first, second, third, and fourth bills. There was no counteroffer. For four months, they said, well, we'll just let the states go bankrupt. This virus is just gonna disappear. And so here we are. And where we are is up against you know, the election, the 11th hour, the Senate focused on confirming this Supreme Court nominee rather than on working with us in a good faith effort to try to get another bipartisan bill across the finish line. So meanwhile, a couple of weeks ago, we passed a $2.2 trillion scale down version of the bill that we had passed in May. So we came down 1.2 trillion. The uh, last offer from Treasury Secretary Mnuchin was at 1.8 trillion. But the devil is in the details, and there were a lot of differences between those two bills. But at least we're talking, and I hope those discussions continue. But I worry that given the Senate's priority, which is this uh, confirmation that we're just going to frankly run out of time before the election. But we're all on 24 hours notice. It's the last thing I want to make sure you know, is that we could get called back during this town hall. And then within 24 hours, I'd have to be uh, in Washington. Uh, so that's where we are. We've got to do all we can to fight for the average American that is struggling through this crisis. We've got to do all we can to protect lives and livelihoods uh, during this pandemic. And we've got to protect the Affordable Care Act because millions of Americans have lost their health and uh, their employer provided health insurance during this pandemic. They've turned to the Affordable Care Act. 47,000 people in our district alone get their health insurance through the Affordable Care Act. And the fact that, that the Republicans and, and the Trump administration would try to undermine the ACA during a pandemic is uh, just unbelievable to me. And this is all about the 129 million Americans who have a pre-existing condition and making sure that they are covered. And you know the reality is that COVID itself is now a pre-existing condition for almost 8 million additional Americans. So it, we, we've got to do all we can to fight for the ACA and that's what I'll do. So with that, we've got a ton of questions and I'm gonna to get to them as uh, quickly as we can. And I will start with Jim who writes, never has there been as devastating a wildfire season as this summer. Mindful of this fact, I'm curious where you stand on the issues of climate change and global warming. And can you please address your goals regarding these topics? Please be specific about how we as residents of this community can begin to enact changes as individuals as a community collectively and as state residents. I'm quite interested and want to get involved, but finding out where to start is not easy. Well, Jim, thank you so much. I was proud to be involved in clean energy for the last 15 years or so before running for Congress. I've been proud to serve on the committees uh, like the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and the House Natural Resources Committee during my time in Congress and uh, proud that we're introducing and trying to pass good common sense legislation to address the climate crisis. And what do we have to do? Well, lots of things. We've got to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions uh, in terms of how we move goods, how we move people, uh, how we build buildings, how we grow food, how we generate electricity. And we've got to do it all and we've got to do it fast uh, because the decisions that we make this decade and next will impact our lives, our children, our grandchildren. Uh, and uh, I think Marshall's work would suggest that a lot of what we can do is not only environmentally the right thing to do, but also economically advantageous. And Marshall, I don't know if you want to add a little bit to that. I think that was a, I think that's a wonderful summary. I, I think what we're finding is, is I think for a long time, climate change was thought about as some lefty issue that we just, people who care about the whales and the environment or whatever. But to me, it's an economic and a health issue, right? This affects all of us. And these investments, as Mike said, are, are yield personal benefits, yield economic benefits and, and really pay for themselves over the long run. And the studies that I've seen suggest that we can create 25 million clean energy jobs by 2050. And the way I see it, this is one of the great 
uh, economic uh, drivers, should be one of the great economic drivers uh, as we recover from this pandemic, as we figure out how we're going to get tens of millions of Americans uh, the, the next great uh, job of the future. Uh, I hope that many of them are in infrastructure, that many of them are in clean energy, in sustainable agriculture, next generation transportation. And there's no reason why our great state of California cannot lead on all of the above. And uh, I think, you know, we're well positioned to do that in transportation, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, the governor's uh, uh, recent uh, zero emission vehicle uh, goals. You know, when you think about uh, Tesla being a California company. I hope that they stay. I hope they keep all their manufacturing in California. But that success story is one that I believe can be replicated. Uh, it took significant federal investment. You know, after the uh, 08, uh, 09 recession, figuring out the Recovery Act, the American um, America Reinvestment Recovery Act, and then uh, thinking through the loan guarantee program, the structure of that. Uh, led to uh, great successes, uh, and I'm very proud of all the work that was done. Uh, and we need to do it again. And we need we needed to, to learn from how 0809 went, what worked, what didn't, improve upon it, and create that next generation uh, of great clean energy companies. Uh, next question: How about this is from Kevin? How about legislation to prevent wildfires, like cleaning up the fuel on the forest floor? Well, it's interesting. I've heard a lot of people kind of talk past one another uh, over the last uh, couple months. And, you know, some people say forest management, forest management. Other people say climate change. Both are true. Those are not mutually exclusive concepts. Uh, but when the president says just rake the forest and the problem will go away, I think he fundamentally uh, misunderstands the nature of the problem. And the reality is a lot of the land that needs to be uh, better managed is federal land. So the president ought to be speaking to his own uh, forest management folks. Uh, but, you know, clean your floors is, is just inadequate. The University of California's Forest Research and Outreach Center analyzed the 33 million acres of forest in California and found that 57 percent, 57 percent is managed by the federal government, 40 percent by private landowners, and 3 percent by the state. So when, when the president says, California, get your act together, it sort of misses the point. Uh, and, you know, I, I think at the same time, the policies that have led to these drier conditions uh, and hotter conditions and increased fire risk need to be uh, reviewed as well. And that's where reducing our greenhouse gas footprint is so important. Marshall, anything to add? Again, no, Mike, just nailing the summaries here. Uh, that's exactly right. So we've seen that, you know, in recent years uh, of the total area burned to wildfires, either in California or across the West, 60 percent or more, uh, definitely over half in most years is on federal land. So this is really a federal issue. I mean, Newsom administration, I think, is, is really keyed in now and is trying to do what they can locally. And fuels management is a big part of it. We got to get out there. We got to thin fuels. We got to do prescribed burns. But the scale of that problem is really big. We have, you know, even if we burned, uh, prescribed burn a million acres per year, it's going to take us 20 years and you get regrowth. And so it, it can't be our only solution. Uh, and at the same time, we need to be doing the other things at a national scale and a global scale that reduce the overall risk that, that, uh, that keep our forests from drying out and, and getting extremely hot and becoming the tinderbox that we've seen in the last few years. And, you know, another thing that I um, see happening that is more of a state jurisdiction issue than a federal jurisdiction is every time we've got wildfires, we're very, very quick to rebuild everything as it was before. And that's, look, that's a very American instinct to want to, to want to do that. Uh, but there are going to be issues with insurance. You know, I, I think that the insurability in some of these areas is going to become increasingly more difficult. And I know that uh, you know, Sacramento is thinking about that, our insurance commissioner and others are, are thinking about that. But I see that as, as something that we're going to have to continuously address, which is, you know, does it make sense to develop, uh, as we have been in some of these higher fire risk areas? And, uh, you know, clearly we, we want to be, uh, you know, very mindful of people's communities and people's homes. Uh, and I, I just think we, we have to just be thinking very carefully about where we build and how we build. 
Uh, Patty in Laguna Niguel asks, what are your thoughts on the removal of nuclear waste from the San Onofre power plant? I feel that's a disaster waiting to happen. Uh, we can't wait. We must get Congress to move forward on this. Patty, I agree that we have to get that waste off the coast. When you think about uh, the waste at San Onofre, as I mentioned at the intro, 1,700 tons of waste, literally 100 feet away from the Pacific Ocean. You have rising sea levels, but perhaps more significantly, you've got two active earthquake faults. You've got a whole network of inactive earthquake faults, uh, and you've got 8.3 million people within 50 miles. And we've got good friends at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and UC San Diego that have studied uh, the area very carefully. And long story short, get the waste away from that area. Uh, also, right across the street from a uh, uh, one of the most important strategic uh, training bases in the United States for our Marines and sailors at Camp Pendleton. So it's clearly not an ideal place to, to have all that nuclear uh, fuel. So what do we do about it? Well, the challenge is that uh, Yucca Mountain in Nevada had been developed through the 80s and 90s. Uh, and then we put the brakes, I say we, the federal government put the brakes on it uh, over a decade ago. Uh, the Trump administration was open to uh, resuscitating Yucca Mountain, but then really slammed the brakes on it uh, about, I don't know, a little less than a year ago uh, when uh, President Trump's uh, supporters in, in Nevada, Sheldon a uh, Adelson and others, uh, you know, came out against it and, and the president came out against it. So where does that leave us? Well, we've invested $16 billion in Yucca Mountain, but the political headwinds uh, won't allow the waste to go there. We've got consolidated interim storage sites throughout the United States where they've tried to license them. Most recently, the one in Texas on the border between Texas and New Mexico, Governor Abbott wrote a letter to President Trump saying that he didn't support uh, a CIS site in Texas. Uh, so, you know, that is obviously uh, a, uh, an impediment to that. Uh, there are other sites as well. Uh, but I think we have to be creative, and that was one of the reasons that it was so important. We got the $500 million for R&D into spent nuclear fuel management as part of our uh, energy innovation bill real, uh, recently. I also have the uh, Spent Fuel Prioritization Act, H.R. 2995, which says that for all the nation's nuclear waste sites, move the waste first from those sites that have the highest population density and the highest seismic risk. That would obviously move our uh, San Onofre waste to the top of the queue. I'm very grateful again to our task force, uh, co-chaired by the former head of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and by a retired Navy Admiral who was the Navy Mayor of San Diego. It's a great report. I hope you read it. It's got about 30 findings and recommendations. And of that, we took about eight with a federal nexus and we're moving aggressively forward on those eight. And uh, that's uh, in a nutshell what we're doing, but read the report if you want plenty more information. Uh, Lori asks, what can be done to prevent the Senate from confirming a Republican justice to the Supreme Court before the election? Well, I think we're watching that unfold right now. And, you know, it is a very unfortunate situation. Um, you know, it's, it's absolutely nothing against Judge Barrett. Uh, but, uh, I think the hypocrisy is pretty thick, particularly those senators who would not allow Merrick Garland to move forward saying that it was an election year, let the voters decide. Uh, and that's what the American people support, incidentally. Uh, and I've spoken with many of our constituents who are pretty upset about this. And I think that we have to put it in the context of what it will mean. Uh, we talked about the Affordable Care Act. We know that an Affordable Care Act case will be heard by the court on November the 10th, just one week after the election. Uh, when you think about um, a woman's constitutional right to make decisions, medical decisions about her own body, or you think about uh, the rights of the LGBTQ community, uh, or the right to organize and uh, collectively bargain, or voting rights. I mean, I'm thinking of my, my uh, late friend, the great John Lewis, uh, and the struggle and the fight for, for uh, voting rights since the mid-1960s, and uh, the erosion of those rights under the 2013 Shelby versus Holder decision and what a uh, Justice Barrett would do on the court. Uh, and I watched her, you know, answers. I think they've been evasive. I think uh, not, uh, uh, you know, without excellent 
efforts from uh, from our colleagues in the Senate. Uh, but uh, I think at this point, we'll see what happens. And, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think the voters will ultimately uh, repudiate the decision to, to jam this forward with just 20 days to go when, you know, well over 10 million people have voted. Uh, and, you know, moreover, I think all the issues that I just mentioned, it's pretty clear where the majority of the American people stand on each of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I am frustrated because they're prioritizing this confirmation over things like COVID relief uh, at a time of dire need for the American people. Uh, but I thank you for the question. Jane in San Juan Capistrano, she writes, how can you tell when it is unsafe to go outside because of smoke? How much smoke is too much to breathe? Well, that's a great question. I was wondering that about a month ago um, here in, in Southern California. And I know, Marshall, you, you guys in uh, uh, Palo Alto and the, in the entire Bay Area, my friend Jared Huffman represents north of the Golden Gate Bridge, his whole district. Um, you know, there's the AQI, and you can get the AQI pretty easily. Um, you know, you can go to the Air District websites. You could go to... The uh, heck, I have it on my Apple Watch. It tells me what the AQI is, uh, but it's been uh, not good. I, I think anything over a hundred is uh, problematic, and, and in some areas, I saw three hundred and up. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, uh, everyone has different sensitivity to air pollution. Uh, we've been dealing with air pollution my entire life in Southern California. Um, the smog alerts, I still remember extremely well during grade school, you know, not being able to go outside at certain points because of the smog in the air. And we took dramatic measures to reduce the uh, particulate matter and NOx and SOx in the air, criteria pollutants. Uh, the California Air Resources Board and the air districts did a great job. Uh, CARB dealing with mobile source pollution, air districts with stationary source pollution. And Wildfires, to this extent, create a whole new series of challenges for our air districts and for, for the uh, folks at CARB. Um, so we did pass this $100 million I mentioned to study uh, the risk of wildfire smoke. Um, but uh, Marshall, I don't know if you had any more uh, input on uh, health impacts of all of this and, and what else our, our viewers should be mindful of. Yeah, unfortunately, what we're finding is that there seems to be no safe level of exposure. There's basically no no good level, but but more exposure is worse. So I think the best thing you can do is try to reduce your exposure to every extent possible. Um, and that means not exercising when it's really bad. This is personally hard for me. I'm a big runner. And so I look at the same thing. I look on my watch and wonder if I can go outside without hurting myself. Um, but you you shouldn't you shouldn't exercise when it's really bad. You should stay inside if possible. If if you can afford air filters, uh, try to invest in them. They're actually again in a cost benefit sense. They're a very very good investment. Uh, they lead to long term health improvements. We know that. Um, so just try to reduce your exposure as much as possible. And, and unfortunately, that's much easier for some communities than for others. And this is a really important environmental justice issue. That again, I think. Uh, Representative Levin's uh, legislation, proposed legislation, touches on. Um, so some of us are going to have an easier job than others, um, but we just have to find ways to reduce our own exposure. Thank you for that. Uh, shifting gears for a second, Greg and Carlsbad asks, I personally experienced three horribly misdirected pieces of USPS mail in my entire life. I've never experienced even one of these failures. With all the shenanigans going on with the USPS, I hardly think this is coincidence. Can the USPS be fixed in time? Well, what I would recommend, uh, Greg, hopefully you've contacted our office and we can specifically dig into the problems that you've had. I've been in touch with our regional folks at USPS and I, I think they're doing the best that they can to uh, you know, protect our uh, postal service and to ensure the timely delivery of mail. Where it's become particularly uh, troubling to me is the reports of veterans going without their medicine. Uh, you know, they, they usually are delivered from the VA in three or five, at most five business days, and now it's taking three weeks. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we're all familiar with what Louis DeJoy was up to. And uh, fortunately, a lot of those efforts have been stopped. Uh, but uh, make no mistake, we've got to get the USPS on a solid long-term financial footing. 
Uh, ever since 2007, when Congress and the Bush administration passed a, a law uh, capping the revenues of USPS and also forcing prepayment of 75, year, uh, 75 years worth of pension obligations, ever since that happened, the USPS has been operating at a loss. And so even before the pandemic, they were tens of billions of dollars in the hole. And then the pandemic greatly exacerbated that. And before Louis DeJoy, who took over, I think in May as Postmaster General, in April, the prior Postmaster General, again from Trump, Trump appointee, along with the Trump Postal Service Board of Governors, they came to the Congress and said, we need a $25 billion lifeline to get through the pandemic and the election. And so that's where that number came from. That's where that number came from. And I led a letter way back in the summer with Brian Fitzpatrick, Republican of Pennsylvania, and it was signed by 137 colleagues. And we said, we need that money. This is not partisan. We need that money. And you know what? We had it in the HEROES Act. And then we had it in HEROES version two, the scaled down version. And we still haven't gotten that money to the USPS. And it's just unbelievably sad. This should not be a partisan issue at all. And uh, we we have to have the Senate act. We have to have the Senate act. So, but again, we see what their priorities are instead of acting on this. Here's one from Nick. Should we just accept that every wildfire season will be worse than the one before? Is there really anything we can do to stop that from happening? Well, I'll turn to Marshall in a second, but based on everything I know, I think the answer is that We've got to take dramatic action to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to keep things where they are so that they don't get further worse uh, still. Uh, now, you know, there are great uh, uh, books and, and movies. Uh, uh, Drawdown comes to mind about how we might be able to reverse some of this uh, if we uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to, to the extent that we can have regenerative agriculture and all the other things that we need to do uh, to create carbon sinks, maybe, maybe things will quiet down. But uh, the, the likely scenario is uh, that if we don't do anything, it will get much worse. And then if we take all the steps we need, it will be, this will be the new normal. It will be manageable to the extent that this is the new normal. But Marshall, I'd love to get your scientific perspective on this. Mine's similar. It's a, it's a very slow ship to turn, uh, but we know how to steer the ship. We, we know what the levers are. We just need to use them. So I think fatalism here is not good. I think we should just figure out what we need to do. And, and again, it's, it's the things we can do in the short run, reducing the risk through prescribed burns and fuels management. And it's the things we can do in the long run. Again, we know how to do both of those things and, and we need to turn the ship. But I, I think that the questioner is right. It's not going to turn overnight. And so we will have to endure some more wildfires, unfortunately. Well, and one other uh, risk here is that we know that COVID-19 uh, is, uh, you know, a respiratory uh, condition that is exacerbated by uh, other respiratory challenges. And to the extent that we uh, can decrease air pollution, decrease wildfires and the related wildfire smoke, it all sort of works uh, hand in hand to try to reduce uh, the impact of something like COVID-19 or any other respiratory virus from, from the severity of, of symptoms and so forth. So just yet another reason why it's important we do this. Uh, Patrice asks, I like this question, Patrice, why can we not make the first Tuesday of November a national holiday so it's easy for everyone to vote? Patrice, we should. It's absolutely a great idea. And in fact, we passed the uh, very first bill that we passed is uh, 116th Congress was HR1, the For the People Act. It had a lot of things in there to get the dark money out of politics, to prevent foreign interference in our elections. And it, it also made Election Day a national holiday, which I think we ought to do. Be a great idea. Julian Vista, uh, she asks, is there any chance that the Republican Senate will pass your amendment or any other legislation to deal with climate change. Well, Julie, you never say never. Um, we had hoped when we'd introduced the Clean Energy Innovation and Jobs Act that we could work with some Senate Republicans. In fact, there are you know Senate Republicans like Lisa Murkowski and Chuck Grassley and others who have, who have embraced major uh, pieces of it. 
I think the challenge is that the environment that we find ourselves in legislatively with the Senate, again, focused on the, the Barrett confirmation in the weeks before the election, uh, rather than on, you know, working with us on any sort of bipartisan legislation. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the uh, probability of doing something, um, I give it a slight potential uh, of happening in the lame duck. Uh, you know, and then, or if the president is reelected, it'll continue to be a difficult environment. We'll try the best we can to work across the aisle. If we have a new president, new administration, and perhaps a new Senate, then, you know, all uh, calculations change. And, and then I think we have a great chance. Elisa asked, we, uh, or says, we own property here in Oceanside and barely make ends meet monthly after mortgages and utilities are paid. Luckily, none of our tenants have not paid their rent, but if the unemployment persists, it's just a matter of time until we are affected. What are the plans to have a safety net for small property owners, read small business owners? Well, Elisa, that is an excellent question. And one of the things that we have passed uh, in the House as part of that HEROES Act that is waiting for consideration in the Senate is emergency rental assistance for exactly that reason. We've started with $100 billion our scaled back version was 50 billion, but unfortunately the Senate Republicans have offered nothing, nothing. And that's one of those fundamental issues where we are far apart. Uh, and so I hear you loud and clear. Um, you know, I, I think that it's absolutely important that they meet us in the middle. And part of that has to be emergency rental assistance for a small uh, property owners such as yourself. Melinda asks, here's one for you, Marshall. Can you ask Professor Burke if there's any new research on innovative ways to address global warming? It seems like the solutions that have been offered are too controversial. Yes, there is a ton of innovation in this space. Um, in the clean energy space in particular, there's all sorts of innovation going on um, from new energy, cleaner energy technologies to ways to get carbon out of the air. Um, we know to meet some of the more aggressive climate targets, we're going to need to remove carbon from the atmosphere, not even, you know, we got to stop putting it in, but we also got to be pulling it out, actually. And so we need technologies to do that. Um, so there's enormous innovation, I think, and excitement around some of those technologies. Um, more investments, more federal support of that sort of innovation and science, uh, I think most would agree is going to be very important going forward. Not only will it create jobs in these industries, but it'll help us develop the technologies that we need to solve this problem. So uh, yeah, I, I think the answer is yes, that there's tons of innovation and, and I think there's room to support more of it. Absolutely. Uh, Casey asks, given the recent economic hardships and high joblessness faced by many of our country's citizens, will you support another stimulus payment similar to the one earlier this year? Yes, absolutely. I think that it's needed. Uh, our latest uh, version of the HEROES Act, as I mentioned, that we passed a few weeks ago, provides another $1,200 in, in direct stimulus, um, very similar to what was in the CARES Act with, with a few fixes. But uh, look, we need to acknowledge, again, that there are 5 million plus long-term unemployed as a result of this pandemic, that there are uh, over 10 million who still have not gotten their jobs back from the impact of the pandemic, and then many others who are right on the border, right on the precipice of not being able to make their bills uh, each month. And particularly in a, an area like ours, uh, that is an expensive place to live, uh, where people are making tough choices every day about the bills that they can afford uh, to pay. And this is something that we've all got to get done. And again, I implore the Senate uh, to prioritize the average American uh, rather than uh, prioritizing uh, things that at the end of the day, uh, you know, they might score political points, but they're not going to help that average American uh, in the short term. Uh, Ward and Oceanside asks, do you support the Green New Deal? Well, first, it's important for me to tell you that I don't think anything that I've ever seen has been more mischaracterized uh, than that resolution, uh, which uh, if you actually take the time to read it, uh, the res resolution as it passed, it doesn't have anything about banning airplanes or hamburgers or anything like that. It is a framework. Uh, what is needed to uh, actually meet the crisis that we face with the science uh, that uh, we know to be true. 
Uh, and so uh, what we need in addition to that framework are the details uh, and the policies uh, and the actual legislation, because that is a resolution, not legislation. So uh, what we have done with our select committee report, uh, what the Biden team has done with their climate plan, uh, and what the Senate is uh, doing as well, uh, you could call all of that the Green New Details. And the only way it all works is if we have the Green New Details. So that's what I'm interested in. And again, I implore you, go to climatecrisis.house.gov and even read the executive summary, but uh, getting to zero net carbon emissions by 2050 across the power se sector by 2030. We've got our Zero Emission Vehicles Act, uh, Jeff Merkley and I leading that. Uh, to try to uh, eliminate our uh, reliance on fossil fuel transportation for new cars. Again, you can keep your car just uh, over time. If you're going to go buy a new one uh, over time, uh, it needs to, uh, uh, you know, hopefully be part of a zero emission transportation uh, ecosystem. But again, we're not talking about doing these things overnight, uh, but we're talking about doing them in the next a uh, couple of decades here, and ultimately that's what the science dictates we need to do. Here's one from Kristen. Uh, has anybody looked at how much climate change is already costing our country as a result of these fires and storms across the country? Well, I know people are looking at, at, at that economic impact. I think we have one of them with us right now. So Marshall, do you want to speak to how much climate change is already costing our country? Yeah, so it's a great question, um, and this is something we have looked at. So we've seen roughly a degree Celsius of warming since uh, over the last 50, 100 years, uh, and that's actually a lot. It might not sound like much, but um, we have a lot of data on how things respond when temperatures warm up, and they tell us that overall economic output declines, our health worsens, uh, and these have real costs. And so we've calculated that these costs are – depending on what you include, again, in the trillions of dollars that climate has already cost our economy. And again, that's a, that's a huge number, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. So I think the message is pretty clear uh, that uh, we often hear about the cost of taking action on climate, but unfortunately we don't hear with the same level uh, of uh, coverage or the same uh, balance the cost of doing nothing. And the cost of doing nothing is very significant. The estimates that I've seen from you and others, Marshall, suggest 25 to $35 trillion in the coming decades uh, to uh, uh, just keep the status quo, keep the fossil fuel industry uh, intact. Uh, and that's not something that makes uh, any sense. Uh, but we are uh, out of questions for now. I am so grateful again to my friend Marshall Burke for being with us. And I wanted to turn it over to you, Marshall, for any closing thoughts or comments uh, on the road ahead. No, it's great to hear all the engagement on these important topics. I mean, I would just encourage folks to, to trust the science. I mean, we try to be as, as nonpartisan, as unbiased, and just it, just follow the science where it leads here. Uh, but people in your district clearly seem to be taking the science seriously. And, and as a scientist who's really worried about that, that's, that's really great to see. Um, so keep doing that um, and, and stay engaged on these really important issues. And, and thanks for having me, Mike. Absolutely. And how do they, uh, how do people follow your work, whether your website or Twitter or Facebook or whatever it may be? What's the best way to follow what you do? Yeah, Twitter's good. Or And uh, we put all our stuff up on websites, I believe, in public science. So everything is up. All our data are up. Always here to talk to folks about science. So it's, it's all public. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, again Marshall Burt uh, from Stanford University for joining us today. Great conversation. Really want to thank um, everybody for providing those excellent questions from across the district. Hope this was informative. We're going to be uh, having uh, more of these in the uh, coming weeks and months. And uh, uh, obviously grateful to my team, our, our communications director, Eric, uh, our chief, Kara, for, for helping to put all these great uh, constituent questions together. Uh, and again, can't stress this enough. Follow the guidelines. So incredibly easy to wear that mask. And uh, we now have heard from many of the scientists who have said that the mask is uh, just as important as anything else and uh, easier than anything else that we could be doing. So wear that mask, socially distance, follow those protocols, stay healthy, stay safe. 
uh, follow the guidance from our uh, governor's office, follow the guidance from our counties, uh, and uh, you know, ultimately take good care of one another. Uh, and before I go, a quick reminder that the Congressional App Challenge, this is a very cool contest that we do each year. The deadline for the App Challenge is October 19th. It's open to middle and high school students in the district. Students can register at Congressional App Challenge, one word, congressionalappchallenge.us. And also, if you haven't registered to vote, please do. And if you haven't filled out the census, I think you have like another day to do that. So please do that. We're very, very grateful. Thanks to everybody for tuning in, and we'll see you all very soon.